A reading from the book of Isaiah. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah, then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The word of the Lord. We'll read our psalm responsively by half verse. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. O Lord, God of hosts, how long will you be angered despite prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. You have made us the derision of our neighbors, and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, the son of you. And so will we never turn away from you. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and in his scriptures. The gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from God <coughs> from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are to belong to Jesus Christ. To, to all God's beloved in Rome, who are called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, 
for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but did not become acquainted with her until the son was born, and he named him Jesus. The gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. Grace and peace. Please be seated. Good morning. Hope you all are doing well today. It's a little chilly. We'll call you folks the faithful remnant. Um, there's a place in the Old and New Testaments um, where, they, where they talk about um, separating the sheep from the goats. So we'll call you all the sheep today. Uh, an interesting story be- lies behind um, our Old Testament reading um, from I- Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 7.14, by the way, is one of the most oft-quoted um, scriptures, Old Testament scriptures, to support the coming of the Messiah in Jesus in the first century um, uh, in the ancient n- Near East. It, you have to look at it through Christian eyes in order to see it l- like that. But if you were a Jewish person hearing Jewish scriptures over the centuries, then that would have been a message of hope that there will come into to this world, a holy child. Uh, the, the context today, though, when, when Isaiah is speaking to Ahaz, it, it is a little bit different. Ahaz is, has the dubious distinction of, of being the worst uh, king there ever was in ancient Israel. He was king of the northern kingdom Judah, and the southern kingdom Israel lied south, and then Assyria lied to just to the north of them. Um, The king of Israel came to the king of Judah, Ahaz, and said, we would like to to create a compact, a pact with you, and and so that when the Assyrians come south, that we can fight them together and and run them off. Well, Ahaz, thinking that the Assyrians were more powerful than than Judah and Israel Israel together, he went to the king of of, uh, Assyria, whose name is Tiglath-Pileser, and he's a big historical figure. You can read about him on the internet if you want to. Um, He goes to the king of Assyria and says, "Um, um, if, if we become friends, will you not run over us when you go to take the Israelites? <laughs> and so um, they, they, he, developed, he developed this little relationship with uh, the, the, North, the kingdom of Assyria. What that did was mean that he sold out his people. Um, to the Assyrians, basically, and became just a remnant nation of the Assyrians. Um, also, what it means is, is that he began to t- take on um, worship of the pagan gods that, were, um, that they worshipped in Assyria. So when Isaiah says to Ahaz, is it too much for you to weary mortals, which the word weary there in Hebrew means to wear out. Is it too much for you to wear out the mortals, in other words, selling them to another nation, that you have to wear out God to, in other words, by worshiping other gods. So it's a fabulous little um, play on words that is used in Isaiah. Again, the scriptures there are hopeful scriptures. You know, God is coming into the world in some form or fashion. This will be the beginning of justice and peace. This will be a time when all life will flourish. This will be the time when we, that we have longed for forever and ever, it seems, and here it comes. That's the hopeful word uh, of the prophet. Uh, see, the signal is this. The woman is with child. So, um, Oops. You might be wondering what I'm holding. Yes, I'm not going to tell you yet. You might notice today also that um, our, gospels, our, our gospel reading is much different than the ones we've heard over, over the last few weeks. It's, um, it's actually a lot softer. Now, the birth of the Messiah happened in this way. It sounds like a children's book, doesn't it? This little story you're about to hear, um, which is so much different than what we heard for the last couple of weeks. John the Baptist out on the Jordan yelling, repent or burn. You, you, you've heard that too. So the language now is much softer. It reads like a children's book. It sounds like a children's book. There is, there's not a lot of hard consonantal words in it. It's very soft. Now the birth of the Messiah took place in this way. 
Um, and then there is the story of Joseph, whom we know jo- Joseph gets a very short piece in the Gospels. This is, this is, this is his moment. Uh, jo- Joseph um, was betrothed to this young woman named, named Mary, and, um, and then she's found to be with child, and Joseph um, says that he doesn't want to disgrace her, which basically means he doesn't want to embarrass himself, and so he plans to dismiss her. Um, he plans to dismiss her, and when he had resolved to do this, lo- lovely language there, um, which, which says to me that whenever you make a plan and you resolve to do, th- do something, it's probably what's going to happen is God's going to step between you and your resolution and change your world, which is exactly what happens to Joseph and to Mary and to us. So um, I had the distinction uh, of being invited to a gathering the other night, um, at uh, uh, this couple's house over in Denver. I got a call a few weeks ago and asked if I would come and, and spend some time with some couples who felt as though they had been um, dismissed or, or um, ridiculed by the church, people who feared, um, feared the church in some way. Um, the, the, bur- people had been burned. When I, when I got the call, there's people who have been burned by the church. Can you come and, to a small gathering at our house and speak to them? Um, which, it was really just more of a conversation, you know, around, around the island in the kitchen. About 20 people gathered in story after story after story of folks who's, who, who their experience with the church has been one not of love, not of soft language, but of hard language, one that has excluded them a, a church that has not seemed to understand where they were coming from in, in this world. And what was so, what I loved about the conversations there is that nobody was mad. Nobody was angry. There was a lot of hurt and there was a lot of misunderstanding. There was a lot of um, inability to comprehend and understand how the Christians who were taught to love and, to, and, and who say they will know who we are by our love, they will know who are Christians by our love, to, to, to them to experience this sort of ugliness, hardness of heart from the church, just church seemed to, to be incongruent with, with the Christian message. So, so person after person was telling story of, 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 of woundedness within the church. There were a couple who had seen, it's a couple of people around the room who seemed to have gotten over that and who had, who had found their way back to the church. And they did so by finding, by finding themselves a loving community um, in which the language was soft and loving um, or as the silent night song goes, um, so tender and mild. Um, so it was really heartwarming. And I felt quite, quite um, honored and, and, and grateful to have been in amongst those conversations. And what the grateful part is, is that even in the midst of pain and hurt and, and um, exclus- ex- exclusion, um, there are people who have come around to a softer place. Um, That sounds very Christian to me, to be able to be hurt, to let it go, and to begin to heal and forgive. And so when you're in a room of people who speak like that, it, it begins to feel as though perhaps you are in church. So I'm holding in my hand a little light you see it? Yeah. I'm going to give all the children one of these um, at the next service. Um, and so, so um, it, whenever, you hear, whenever you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and whenever you hear of God coming into this world and God with us, Emmanuel, um, what you're hearing is a testament of faith, a fe- testament of freedom. Um, when God comes into the world, um, in, in Christian terms, in theological terms, we are free from sin. We, sins have been forgiven and they no longer bind us so what happens in Jesus is freedom there's a lovely line in John's gospel um, what, what came into being in him was life and the life was the light of all people and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overtake it I love, I love that line so I'll give all the um, children one of these lights just as a reminder that they are light and darkness does not have power over them. So if you're thinking kids' thoughts and you're thinking um, perhaps um, what this might represent to a child and you think about a song, you might think about what? 
This little light is mine. I'm going to let it shine. You know, you know this song. Do you know that that song was sang um, in, in 1965 in Selma, Alabama, during the civil rights, civil rights movement, when people gathered to march from Selma to Montgomery, instead of standing up in front of Governor George Wallace and all his people around him and saying, we want freedom, what they did was sing, this little light is mine, I'm going to let it shine. And they began to sing this spiritual song of light and love and freedom and what it means to live in a world that sees all humanity as equal in the eyes of God. And each of us has some life and light to share. That's a pretty powerful message if you're a child, right? <laughs> Which is why Christmas is so awesome when you're a child, is because it is really, really a hopeful time, even if they don't connect the coming of the Messiah and the coming of freedom and the coming of life and light, even if they don't make that connection, what happens in them over during this time is a certain letting go of all the darkness that is in this world. They forget about what the problems they have in their families. They forget about what's going on in school. At least for a moment, there is some sort of suspension of, of life as we know it. And in that suspension of life as, as we know it comes into this world a spirit of hopefulness and peace, love, light. And that is what Christmas is all about. When you're an adult, though, sometimes it's hard to be open to that. So earlier in the week, I was, um, I was, I was, I saw this book on my shelf that I hadn't read, I hadn't read it at all. I, I don't know, I even remember when I bought it, but it was um, a children's book. I'll tell you the name of it. It was um, Because of Winn-Dixie uh, by Kate DiCamillo. Anybody ever heard of that book? It's a fabulous little book. It's a beautiful little book about this little girl and this dog. Um, so uh, you, you really should read it. It'll take you about 15 minutes. Um, I think it's a couple hundred pages maybe, but big words, a little page. Anyway, um, it's a fabulous little book, and I was reading this book, and I'm thinking about preaching, and I'm thinking about John the Baptist, and I'm thinking about all these things, and Isaiah yelling at Ahaz, and, um, and John the Baptist yelling at all the, all the um, uh, say it for me, Pharisees who came out, come out. I'm thinking about all this stuff, and then just to read, read that children's book was to just kind of submerge oneself in a softer, more loving language. And as I read that book, and I got to tell you, it's such a sweet book. If, if, if you don't shed a tear during that big book, you just have a heart of stone. It, it's just such a fabulous little book. And I'm reading that book, and I'm thinking, I bet this is what Christmas was like for Mary. And I bet this is what Christmas is like for those who really are able to soften up and receive it. A spirit of hopefulness a spirit of freedom, a spirit that allows us to sort of let down all, all our barriers and to smooth off our sharp corners, a spirit of life that comes into the world in a tender and gentle way. What's the song? So silent night, holy infant, so tender and mild. What that says to me, and I think what it says to us, is that when God comes into this world, it is soft, it is gentle, it's quiet, it's loving. And so when we think about Jesus and Mary and Joseph and all those little animals running around them and the straw and the manger, when we think about those things, that is God's soft entry into this world. And it's not just about thoughts about the soft entry of God, it's also thoughts about how we respond to a world that seems dark and cold and hard. We have to, regardless of our woundedness, submit in faith to light and love and begin to let that light shine. The birth of Jesus 
is about healing for all of us, for all the world. Let your light shine. Amen. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. As we end this Advent season, as we prepare for the coming of the Messiah, let us pray to the Lord saying, Lord, have mercy. That our gracious Savior may rouse us from sleep and make us attentive to the nearness of his presence. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord that way we may discover God's word in every sound of this world, God's touch in every human embrace, and God's love in every gesture of self-sacrifice among us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That divine energy and holy grace may bring our hearts to vigilance and make us see with uncovered eyes the Christ who suffers in his people's agonies. And let us pray to the Lord. That we may come to recognize in our holy assembly gathered for prayer that Jesus the Christ is with us here to make our songs of praise and pleading his own. Let us pray to the Lord. that God's coming into the days and years of our human history may be always new, always brimming with light to drive all darkness away. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord that we may remember and be grateful for all blessings of this life, especially our home, God's earth. Let us pray to the Lord. That you may receive all who had died in the hope of the resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, please add your prayers either silently or aloud. We pray also for the members of the U.S. Armed Forces and their families, especially Walter, Glenn, Nick, Doug, Michael, Alex, Mary, Micah, and Monty. For the safety and health of all expectant parents, especially Jim and Karen, James and Diane, Ryan and Brittany, Paul, 
and Monica. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, remembering today the Anglican Church of Ireland, the Diocese of Kilmore, Elfin, and Argda, and the Right Reverend Farron Glenfield. And we pray for the churches of Colorado, especially All Saints in the Mountains Missions in Crested Butte, Chapel of the Resurrection in Lyman, Church of the Holy Comforter in Broomfield, Sudanese Community Church in Denver, our diocesan deputation to the General Convention, all those in the ordination process. Please join in affirming our vision statement. The mission of St. Paul's Episcopal Church is to live out the love of God as seen in Jesus Christ. We will, with God's help, discover God's presence in word and sacrament, share God's word, nurture God's people, personal growth on our shared journey, and act justly and peaceably. Grant, O oh God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so soften every human heart that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace through the light of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We pray to you also, O God, for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in the newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. May Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you.